which is the Estonian way. Any new technology that gives us a chance not to speak is a great one. Uh, and this discussion is going to be shown at Viru Folk tomorrow. So what better way to celebrate folk music um, than to watch a discussion on the Nordics. So, but enough of that. Uh, we have three guests, um, one from Sweden, one from Norway, and one from the UK slash Denmark. And we'll get into that. And I'll give uh, each of you, by the way, you're more than welcome to sit. Uh, I'll give uh, each of you to, 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 uh, uh, a chance to um, say who you are and uh, why you think uh, you're here. So we'll start with, uh, at the far end, uh, Helen Russell. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Helen. Uh, I am a British journalist originally from London, as you may be able to tell. And uh, at the start of 2013, my husband came home one day and told me he'd been offered his dream job working for Lego in Denmark. And um, it had never crossed my mind to leave London, but uh, I had been ill on and off for six months. We were both so tired and stressed, my husband and I never got to see each other. And we figured that a change might just do us good so we risked it all and moved from central London to the middle of nowhere rural Denmark in bleak midwinter and um, decided that I would give it a year I did give it a year to live as Danishly as I could and see if it made me any happier as a result because I kept reading that Denmark was the happiest country on earth so I set myself the challenge to live Danishly and see what happened so that's why I'm here. Thanks. Yes, I'm uh, Joel Wittsjö. I'm a professor in uh, social psychology from the University of Tromsø in Norway. I guess I'm invited because I have been conducting research on happiness for more than 30 years now. And since happiness is one of the topics for this debate, I guess I'm a kind of the scientific uh, part of the panel. And, and uh, I need a I need a microphone. Thank you. I'm Bengt Lindroth from Sweden, Swedish journalist, uh, retired since some years, but uh, I'm now working as a freelancer. And I think the reason why I was invited is that I just written a book published in Sweden this spring. Uh, it's about populism and nationalism in the Nordic countries. And um, the, um, what you can see here in, on the front is a um, fat and happy man. Uh, in his uh, bathing suit. Uh, it's uh, Morgan Glistrup, the first real pure populist we had in the Nordic area. And um, the reason um, why I'm here is that I want to speak maybe not so much of happiness. I would rather, uh, from my perspective, talk about unhappiness. Why we have so many unhappy people in the Nordic countries and they seem to become in more and more. Excellent. So we have tension built in, uh, which is beautiful. <laughs> now, um, let's try to set a standard or, or some sort of a level of agreement here, uh, just to kind of uh, talk a little bit about uh, what do we mean when we talk about the Scandinavian model or the Nordic model, um, and then kind of uh, slip onwards uh, to, to talk about the studies that we keep uh, hearing about uh, that the Danes are the happiest and the Finns are the best educated and all of that um, and then kind of mix in our semi-skeptical curiosity uh, in our truth-seeking mission to try to figure out if it's all true or if it's all a fake act uh, that the Scandinavians are putting on to laugh at the rest of us who are so envious and angry all the time um, and then We'll, we'll also explore, explore the, the kind of uh, potential relationship between the kind of societal model uh, and the welfare model that the Nordics uh, have at some point uh, chosen and uh, explore whether uh, the happiness or unhappiness, as uh, Bengt has just uh, put his foot on, uh, put down on, uh, if, if that's somehow the effect of the chosen model or if it's uh, somehow genetic. Uh, so. Is the Scandinavian, is the Nordic welfare model alive and well today? Does it still exist? Um, perhaps, Helen, uh, you as an outsider have parachuted in and looked around with fresh eyes, uh, Anglo-American eyes, I suppose. Uh, 
as an outsider, uh, what does the Scandinavian model or the Danish model in your case look like, feel like? How would you wrap it up? I guess for me, um, it, as you say, it is the social welfare safety net. So the alarming thing as a Brit uh, is, is you arrive uh, somewhere like Denmark, as I did, and suddenly it's 50% 50, 50 plus taxes. Um, but I was constantly being told, look at all these services you get in return. Well, in the UK, we get a health service, we get subsidized dental care, we get a lot of those things as well. But I guess what Denmark is doing differently is in the UK and the US, we have fought for more money. We work long hours, we don't take load, very long holidays, um, capitalism is, is king and, and we want more, we want to earn more. Whereas it feels like in Scandinavia people have fought for more time. They have time with their family, there is a short working week, there is good parental leave. Um, if your kid is sick you get the day off to look after them in Denmark and, and I think in Norway as well as we've been talking about on the way over here. So it feels to me as though that social welfare safety net makes a big difference to the mentality uh, in Scandinavia. I don't know what my, my fellow panelists would make of that, but um, that's certainly how it felt for me. You are. Well, as um, a social psychologist, uh, I know that humans are not only social, but they are ultra-social. We are so social in our minds that you don't believe it. I mean, when social psychologist has have studied this for I would say 20 or 30 years thoroughly with new methods almost every year new things comes up that shows us that we are even more social than we used to think a few years ago for example they have now discovered that the default mode of thinking what you think of if you do not do anything is social I mean People think about others almost all the time. When they talk together, they talk about others almost all the time. 70 to 80% of what we talk about are other people. I think the Nordic welfare model understood this early on, that we are in this together. We are social creatures, and the idea behind the social way of having a welfare state is that we are solidarity with, it, with each other. So rather than having the family taking care of you, we think that having a state that takes care of you, no matter who you are, I mean, rich or poor, doesn't matter, young or old, doesn't matter, somebody is there to take care of you. I think that is one of the major features, I think, of the Nordic welfare model, this everybody together thing, uh, and that's what makes it different from other European social welfare systems. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I think, uh, um, to add something to what, to what uh, you are said, um, you, I think you could also say that Scandinavians or, or Nordic uh, inhabitants believe in collective uh, solutions on, on social questions, um, because um, that gives the individual a possibility not to worry too much and that gives the individual a possibility to emancipate him or herself in a way that wouldn't be possible if you didn't uh, have these collective solutions that you that uh, uh, you could feel safe in a way that maybe you should uh, you're not if you live for instance in the United States and have, have uh, other kind of of system and I think that's very important because this emancipation uh, question uh, for instance for women the chance for equality between uh, men and woman is an important part of the uh, that kind of equality that we believe in and uh, the, the social welfare state is uh, better uh, for, for giving us what we want in that case now it may seem uh, from the outside looking in that uh, Scandinavi Scandinavians are somehow genetically predisposed to be all that, uh, you know, uh, looking for collaboration instead of conflicts, you know, collective decision making instead of individualism, um, equality on a number of different fronts. 
But then, as I understand, it act it's actually not that old, this approach. Uh, I think um, there was an article in the New Yorker, which, which I all recommend you read, uh, which I think the, the Northern uh, Facebook page has been promoting recently, uh, wonderful insights, which mentioned that uh, I think it was in 1891 when in Denmark, uh, uh, it was the first time when uh, social welfare uh, was actually being given to retired people. Uh, and then there was some, some workplace insurance uh, added uh, some years later in Norway. So it's not like it's been happening, a, you know, thousands of years, or if it has, then at least it has not been codified or uh, we're not perceiving uh, uh, the Nordics uh, as it is now. Uh, we haven't perceived, uh, perceived it for, for, you know, centuries. So at some point it was a decision. Uh, so. Was it a decision? And if it was so, then where did it come from? And right after that, we'll slip right into the happiness talk, which is uh, where the, the most beautiful conflict can happen. Anyone? I have views on this, and I have a badge that says I have opinions <laughs> as well. So, um, so uh, fr from my research into Denmark, because that is my area of expertise, as it, as it were, um, I think you're absolutely right. These are decisions that have been made, and because these countries are small, there is the capacity to, to sit down and plan and make decisions, whereas some other nations may not have, have been able to or have been a bit, a bit more sprawling. So in, um, oh, there goes my hat cannot be too sunny now. Um, so in um, in Denmark, at least, in the 1920s, there were huge social and economic challenges, but the government at the time decided that, for instance, design should be a priority, and so invested in uh, design schools and public sculpture and architecture, and this fostered, um, you know, the real appreciation for the aesthetics that we all think about around around Denmark and, and much of Scandinavia. Again, after the, first, after the Second World War, there was a sh shortage in the labour force, so they thought they sat down they drew out okay how can we get more more workers okay we can make it easier for workers to come in and we can also oh I know women they can work as well they've got something to offer so you know the the um, the infrastructure was created to enable women to work more easily with with childcare, um, as Bank mentioned, sort of policies to promote equality. So these have been decisions that have been made. And also, I guess, as, as you alluded to, that it's not something that people are just born with in Scandinavia, but as smaller nations, um, there is the possibility, and traditionally homogenous nations in the case of Denmark, to have a, a sort of group thinking, a group way of doing things, which means that things can be decided and put into practice more easily than perhaps they can elsewhere. So from my perspective, certainly these are decisions that have been made. I guess the reason why I made that reference was to, because all of us, most of us, uh, here in the crowd who are Estonians are looking at it from from the Estonian lens uh, And you know, it's it's all too easy sometimes to just wave things off saying well But yeah, that of course it is like that in Norway because they're Norwegians uh, They're rich and oil. they're Norwegians and they drink oil for breakfast <laughs> But then again, yeah, you sit down you make a decision you choose to go uh, either right or left um, If uh, any one of you want to jump in and add uh, anything feel more than welcome to Historically seen, you could say that the welfare state, or this uh, Swedish or Nordic model, or whatever you call it, um, and in a political sense, they are um, created during the 20th century by um, the social democratic parties and uh, the agrarian reformist parties. And, and uh, that is the answer to your question more exactly. And uh, that's when it started, and after the Second World War, uh, they developed and, and uh, into the systems that we know today, and that we are discussing right now. Yeah, if I just may add a small thing from Norway, I'm not an expert on the social welfare system since I'm a social, since I'm a psychologist, but I, I think one of the things that was in Norway before the welfare system uh, came out as an idea was. The, the equality, the idea of equality was very important. In Norway, we had a lot of poor people. 150 years ago, we were among the poorest countries in Europe. We didn't have any oil at that time. But there was a long coastline that provided fish for everyone. So we were, could, even if we were poor, we were seldom starving. We were not hungry, but we were poor. And that made, I think, the idea of equality, everybody can make something out of for him or herself, was an important part of the history 
to accept what was coming up later on as the welfare state. Now you are, I guess we can now move closer to your field of expertise, uh, psychology and the way people feel about themselves, about the society around them and their attitudes towards it. Uh, now, study after study after study seems to indicate that the Nordics rank very high uh, on the happiness uh, scale. Uh, why? What's wrong with you? I don't think if there's something very wrong with us, but again, as a psychologist, I would recommend you to look a little bit behind the most spectacular first impression. We as humans, we tend to notice what pops out at big or spectacular or something, but what is really important is quite often something behind that. So when you come from Britain, you say, well, look at this expensive beer, look at the high taxes. What you do not notice until later is that, well, for that tax money, we buy you some kind of security, <coughs> some trust, and so on. Uh, so, uh, what was the question again? The question was, why on earth are you guys so happy? Yeah, exactly. So you have to look behind the first impression, the big thing, the media headlines maybe, and see what is going on beneath that, because what is going on beneath is what is important. And again, what is going on beneath has to do with social relations. First and foremost, perhaps, trust. If you have trust in order, then the rest of it comes much easier. I suppose it's uh, quite strongly connected to, uh, there are so many ways to approach this, uh, but one being um, you feel connected to the fabric of decision making. There is a strong civic society. Uh, the distance between, or at least the perceived distance between the governed and the governors uh, feels less than perhaps in some other regions, uh, which I guess stems directly from social participation. It's not like us and them and, you know, you guys take care of politics. I'm just uh, a farmer and I don't really care. All I can do is go to, street, uh, go to the street and wave my fist around if I'm un unhappy. So that kind of participation and feeling as part of a whole must very strongly play into it. Yes, I think uh, it does, you're right. Uh, but again, I, I think uh, when those things are in order, you don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to pay much attention to all these big things, and you can concentrate on the smaller things, because the big things are okay. And that is how our lives are organized in other respects as well. I mean, if something happens here, if a fire turns out, for example, then we suddenly start to do something else, we become stressed. As long as there are no fire on this stage, and as long as these important things that takes care of the important things in our life are okay, then we can concentrate our minds on other things. If, on the other hand, you have to think continually on how to get your next meal, how to deal with sickness, bad health, and so on, that's what occupies your mind, and that is not what makes you happy. So if you are free to think about other things, then you have a good starting point for having a good life. All right, so let's bring in Bengt, uh, and let's uh, make a strong case for uh, the, surface, uh, the surface appearance of happiness, but the underlying boiling current of depression and unhappiness uh, underneath. So is that uh, perceived happiness and, and satisfaction with uh, people's lives and the way that society is being run, are the, uh, are the Scandinavians honest when they feel and say they're happy? Uh, and what does that say about the ability or inability for Scandinavians to address the problems that they have? Are they honest, your question? Yes, I would say in general, uh, the, the Scandinavians and Nordic people are honest in their belief in, in the good fortune with these systems, absolutely. But um, you can get disillusioned as well. You um, have politicians promising you quite a lot, and you um, may think that these systems and these security, it will last forever and ever and ever. And um, you discover suddenly that the things aren't that way. 
um, and uh, then you could react in different ways and that's what we are experiencing right now that we have been experiencing in in the Scandinavian country uh, since the uh, 1970s more or less in different countries because the uh, development and, and <coughs> the political um, uh, yeah, political develops and developments we see in these countries they, they differ a lot so um, uh, so this disappointment and these um, feelings of the welfare society or the threats the fears that they will disintegrate um, that they um, are um, taking different shapes in the different countries we could maybe come back to that but there is such a uh, such a tendency, such uh, atmospheres spreading and, and uh, in the politics, uh, uh, among ordinary people, but also in the, in the culture, for instance. We have this uh, Nordic Noir, which is a theme in uh, television, film and, and literature, uh, crime literature especially, so, which also is one expression of these feelings and these feelings of disillusionment, uh, I would say. I guess what I hear is that you know it would be naive to believe that what has worked in the past will be immune to everything else that's going around uh, on the planet, and there needs to be some sort of a correction, uh, which has obviously been already taking place for years. The Nordic welfare society as it exists today is not what it was like 15 years ago. Uh, I, I, I try to say it authoritatively, even though I'm not an expert on the field. But I'm on stage, and that means I'm important. <laughs> uh, so, but but let's let's talk a little bit about the, the kind of potential paths that the the, the model can take. Uh, uh, you know, if if you cannot just be naive about you know being wrapping yourself in wishful thinking and thinking that this is how things will continue to be, and somehow our model will win and survive, uh, what kind of choices are there in front of Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden today um, that would balance the society's desire to be helpful, supportive, uh, you know, support the middle class, uh, overall you know, general happiness versus facing some of the very real problems in terms of politics, economics, you know, uh, ethnic tensions, nationalism. What kind of choices do, do we have in front of us in Scandinavia today? Oh. Thanks for that. Um, okay, well, whoa. Um, I think, um, just touching on the Nordic Noir thing, I think you can only have, typically, um, when, when sort of such dark artistic expression comes out of a country, it's because uh, they, people feel secure enough to be able to do that. So there's not, maybe there's, there's an argument that there's nothing massively exciting happening, so we'll make the art that scary. I think in terms of um, your question, there's, there's something to be said about trying not to take things for granted and freedom within boundaries, as, as Bent said. So I think there's, in Denmark at least, I speak to a lot of businesses who are clean, keen to work out how to attract more international talent. And the tricky thing is, is that the kind of international talent that will be drawn to Scandinavia are the more liberally, uh, more liberal, more on the left, people who don't mind paying such high taxes. And what's special about Scandinavia is this welfare state, is this equality. So it's sort of recognizing that and preserving that a bit more and not taking it for granted, whilst also trying to uh, celebrate diversity a bit more. Um, I think as a typically homogenous country in Denmark and in, in, in Norway and, and Sweden as well to an extent it's trying to sort of welcome in new people and realize that that can be a good thing um, whilst also celebrating the great things that you already have there what was else is your question sorry anything you want it to be <laughs> well I kind of interpreted in your question uh, an assumption about a change that has to take place and I, I am a bit uh, careful about people who says this is how the future is going to be because we know that we are bad at predicting what the future is going to look like even the experts are very bad at predicting what the future is going to look like we also know uh, that there is a phenomenon called self-fulfilling prophecies which means that you can say that so and so is going to happen 
and it happens as a consequence of you saying it. It didn't have to happen, but it does, and it did so because somebody said it was going to do so. So I would say I'm skeptical when I hear people say, well, development forces us to change what is working very well to something that is working not so well. So why is that? Why should we accept that development means that pensions are going down, that healthy people, no, unhealthy people are not going, getting the treatment they used to get anymore? I mean, are you aware that the next generation is the first for hundreds and hundreds of years that have fewer prospects than their parents had? So for every generation for hundreds of years, the children have better prospects than their parents had. No, that has changed. So why should we accept that this is going, this must happen because of development? I think we should think of development as something that goes better, some betterment. That is development for me. And I don't accept people who say, well, we can't expect this to go on because so on, so on, so on. Be critical to that. I think. Well, um, <clears throat> I think, um, first of all, uh, in, in, in all the Nordic countries, we, uh, the political systems and the people and, and the voters, they, um, they want to do what they can in order to make the, the welfare systems uh, sustainable as good and uh, having them accommodated to new circumstances, etc., etc. But above all that, uh, considering the future, uh, there are two things. Uh, that are important. Uh, one is what do we mean, and that means especially uh, the Swedes, what do we mean when they talk about the future uh, multicultural society or the multiculturalism that we say that we are forwarding uh, already today? Because uh, if we take the example of Sweden, which is maybe extreme in this sense, because Norway, Denmark and, and, and Finland, they are a bit more uh, uh, nationalistic, outspoken than, than uh, Sweden has been, at least. And Sweden is, if I am rightly informed, the only country in the world, maybe, that has in its constitution um, a paragraph that says that Sweden should encourage uh, um, an, an, an uh, development to, towards a multicultural society. Uh, we should encourage uh, uh, congregations and, and uh, uh, foreign language, etc., coming in with uh, with, uh, with immigrants, and that's quite unique. But we have never haven't really discussed it, discussed until today what that means in practice. What should we do? What kind of policies? And that is the most important question, I think, for us in Sweden uh, to to. Um, handled today. Um, the other question is, and that's uh, for, for all these uh, Nordic countries as well as for the Baltic ones and for Estonia, is that we have to coordinate ourselves with the development uh, or um, uh, so lack of development in Europe and the European Union today. These two are the most important questions and they decide uh, what will happen in the future and what paths for, for the, the Nordic society are possible at all. Now, oh, you are obviously, you, you did a smart thing here, saying that, you know, words have power and if uh, and, and, and uh, self-fulfilling prophecies are real, uh, but that doesn't, shouldn't discourage us from, you know, discussing the, the you know, potential avenues that, that the region could take. Um, so, let us be irresponsible for a second and, and fast forward a little bit, uh, you know, 10 years from now. Will we be talking about the same things in, a, in the same way? Uh, talking about happy societies, similar dilemmas, uh, a forceful yet small minority of uh, right-wing uh, parties in the region that has found its place uh, but doesn't grow too much. So, I mean, if you fast forward 10 years, what will Scandinavia, what will your countries be like and if you don't want to make a commitment to that, uh, then at least I guess you can voice the choices, the, the, the kind of reasonable best case scenario and the reasonable uh, less good scenario. Like, uh, I, I'm sure that the voters, the politicians, you know, face choices every year. The outside world forces us to react 
and to re-examine the choices that these countries have made so far. Um, so what do you see when you look forward into the future? Well, again, we are bad to predict, so I don't want to commit myself, as you said. I think uh, I like utopias, because <laughs> utopias, they are irresponsible. They just throw out some ideas and say, hey, look, isn't this a good way of living? And I think uh, in my utopia 10 years from now, which is not long enough for utopia to develop into something real, but in I... Life. <laughs> anyway, I, I hope that as a person doing research on happiness, I hope that in 10 years from now we talk more about things that matter. And I think things that matter are about good lives and good societies. That we have developed a better language, that we have developed better metaphors for what we really would like with our lives and where the society should head. Not only discuss economy and prosperity in a short distant perspective, but what do we really want our kids to, to experience as they grow up? What do we really want with this society? So 10 years from now, I hope that we have a better language and like debates like this is going on all the time, also among politicians, also in the media, that uh, the public opinion takes the idea of a good life seriously enough to discuss it every day. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> something familiar for, for, for my part. I wish we would have um, a public arena uh, that is capable of, of, of uh, forming a discussion of that kind that, that uh, you are mentioned with new words, new expressions that cover the, the new reality. Let's say, in, for, in the case of Sweden, definitely a multicultural reality. And so we can discuss it openly and um, a bit unpassioned, but still with emotions um, and uh, get into some kind of, of uh, results, political results that could be. And um, that public arena should uh, be widened uh, also to all the other Nordic countries. So we realize in Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway, in Finland, that when we are talking about this model, this, this uh, uh, collective security, social security system that we like so much and mm -hmm. hope so much for, uh, then I think uh, we should have it should be a common discussion for uh, with uh, with the public in all the countries taking part in one discussion and that makes also includes of course Estonian people and uh, uh, Baltics and uh, maybe maybe the whole of, of, of Europe in in the real utopian case. I got a couple. Um, so, firstly, I think uh, with with children, I am I am working a lot um, with schools and sort of and spoiler alert, anyone who has not read my book, but halfway through our uh, first year of living Danishly, I discovered that I was finally pregnant after many many years of trying and very much failing. Um, and so now I have a two year old, and just looking at the Danish school system and the way that kids are raised in Denmark is just staggering as an outsider because I was raised in the UK in the 1980s where we were taught not to trust. We were taught to trust less. There was something called the Stranger Danger campaign where you were basically educated to think that uh, as a child here I would think any one of you was probably out to get me. Whereas in Danish schools as, as the rest of the panel have alluded to, uh, in, in much of Scandinavia you're encouraged to trust the welfare state means that you trust your neighbours probably not going to rob you to put food on the table because everyone is looked after. And so I think the real opportunity and what I would really hope for is that, that kids are continue to be taught to trust in schools and also that sustainability uh, starts to be brought into the, the discussion. So Aarhus, uh, Denmark's second city, is the European capital of culture next year and they are running a big project about sustainability and childcare and schools and how and what a difference that can make. And I think we all can become a bit disillusioned but if you can get kids to be really enthused about about the idea about trust and what the future looks like and what kind of planet they want to have then that feels like a really positive step forward and the second thing I would really push towards is around uh, women as 
it seems to be the lady end of the panel this end. I'm counting you on this. Um, so uh, as, as a woman coming from the UK where feminism is enjoying quite a resurgence, I was quite surprised when I came to Denmark, you think of it as a, a fairly um, equal society. Scandinavia is typically thought of as fairly good for both genders, but um, feminism, not many, not many Danes certainly will proclaim themselves as feminists when I arrived in 2013. This is changing slightly, and I hope it continues to do so, because otherwise, as we've talked about taking things for granted, otherwise those privileges get eroded, otherwise things start to slip in. In the UK, we've seen in the recent EU referendum, if you don't sort of fight for the things that you believe in, they, they get taken away or they slide away. So. As, as a British woman moving to Denmark, I was struck by the fact that uh, breadwinning is considered just as important as um, caregiving, and that you can you can have a family and you can have a career. So I would really hope that in 10 years' time, that is just a given, and that that's what kids in Scandinavia are growing up believing and expecting and fighting for. Now, research, irrespective of country, uh, seems to show that uh, when the media shows you a world that's full of death and violence and war, then you feel that the world is a more dangerous place, quite understandable. Uh, next to that, there is statistics that the world is actually much safer now than it has been ever before. Um, yet, uh, media coverage does influence people's thinking, it influences public debate, uh, let's take a pulse of your individual countries uh, in as much as you're exposed to the local media environment. Um, in the US, in Western Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, you know, debate has shifted quite strongly. Uh, umbrellas, free umbrellas. Uh, Norden, do we have more umbrellas? No. Okay, uh, huddle together, be strong. We are the sauna nation, we know how to handle this stuff. <laughs> right. Um, so towards a feeling of more danger, or is there something else going on? Uh, are you, in the Nordics, immune to the goings-on of the world that produces Brexit, produces Donald Trump, and everything else? I mean, not immune, but it's... Thank goodness there's not Fox News. I mean, it's it, we are in a 24 news, 24 hour news culture, wherever we are these days. So no, not certainly not immune, but and I don't know that it's got massively worse recently, but it's it's not as bad as it is elsewhere. And perhaps the the big bad news is not the worst news or the worst thing about media today. I think the quick switching from one topic to another. Uh, the lack of a room for concentration, the lack of ability to concentrate for some time over an issue or a topic, which is necessary to, I mean, it's really necessary for a democracy, I think, that you have rooms, you have uh, arenas where a thought can be developed and link it on for more than five seconds before the next news or playing or whatever you have on your social media or half social media which is really is uh, it's a bigger threat than the content as such we, we i think we really stand in front of a challenge of having news uh, broadcasted to us in a way that makes us able to reflect on it i know from britain for example uh, 50 years ago you had one hour long talking program on bbc one person talking for an hour and people were interested, people were engaged and people were listening in for an hour. Today that would be impossible and I think that is a loss and a bigger threat, as I said, than that you hear about all this bad news all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I don't know what I actually have to add there. I don't know if the media is actually a problem. Of course, um, you're right in what you're, what you're saying. I, I think one of the problems is that um, things happening in the world, the violence, the, the uh, violent environments, etc., and the fears and threats that, that uh, you can uh, feel, emotions among people. And we don't have 
I would say at least in Sweden, and I think in, in or maybe that's true also for the other Scandinavian countries, the politicians, the leadership, what we could call the elites, they don't actually know uh, how to handle these emotions or take care of these emotions or answer to these deep uh, uh, emotions among people. And um, that makes it possible for media to step in and uh, exaggerate things, especially uh, social medias, and that makes it uh, possible also for populist pop, uh, politicians of, of, of different kinds, left or, or uh, right wing, to step in and take over and, um, uh, so to say, play on these emotions. And um, the, it has always been that way in politics, you could say, but I think that's a problem, more of a problem today in Sweden, because the, uh, we don't have an, a politician in Sweden like Olof Palme, for instance, in the 70s, who had a rhetoric uh, that to, could take care of the emotions um, that you found in the, uh, among the social changes that took place in the Sweden in those days. And um, that's what I'm missing, actually, politicians of that time. I would just add, with my millennial hat on, um, I think that there is something very interesting in Denmark, and I don't know whether in Sweden or Norway or Finland this is true to as much of an extent, but I was surprised by how little Twitter usage there is. So in the UK, uh, many people are operating within an echo chamber because they follow people who feel or believe similar things to them on Twitter and we are reflected, we get our own views reflected back to us and Twitter trolling is, is obviously a huge problem as I'm sure you're all aware but in Denmark there is there is far few fewer of, of the population are on Twitter and Facebook is very much still the social media of choice and Facebook as we have seen in many studies is where of course there is still trolling but it tends to be um, longer because it's not limited to a certain number of characters. So I think the fact that Twitter is not as pervasive in Denmark um, lets Danes off the hook slightly and we are immune to some of the more uh, reactive knee-jerk reactions that, that you see in the UK certainly. I wonder how much of it has to do with kind of the, the perceived national traits of the Nordic people being really stoic and calm and emotionless. I think there was a uh, a little joke in an article recently, uh, I think it may have been the same one in the New Yorker, where, oh, there's not much ethnic tension. The biggest uh, arguments um, through the decades have been uh, between the countries or between different types of thinking uh, has been about whether or not to put uh, candles on Christmas trees. So if you're less receptive to kind of emotional reactions to the world around you, as the Scandinavians would seem to be, then it's also less easy to manipulate you into reacting uh, in an emotional way on the public square. No need to comment. I think you might have a point there. Yeah. <laughs> a very unemotional Scandinavian response. Uh, by the way, thank you everyone for sticking around in, in spite of this. Uh, so I want to also remind ourselves that you have a voice as well. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so if you want to throw something out, uh, something that we have completely ignored, uh, or not. I have a question. So, um, I read uh, Michael Booth's uh, Scandinavian Utopia. So, how do you comment the paraphrasing slightly? Um, the Scandinavians, the, the country that has been um, Sort of um, sponsored by um, anti depressants The fact that Scandinavian countries is the fourth. I mean, you all together: uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland. Is that discussed in media? Or the fact that uh, Denmark has the highest rate of uh, cancer? Yeah. So this is this is something that I have um, talked about as well in my book. Um, so the. The antidepressant thing I found really interesting myself coming there and thinking, well, how can you be the happiest nation, you know, such high antidepressant use? And actually, the way when I've spoken to experts about it and I've, I've interviewed many Danes um, who have either taken antidepressants in the past or are currently 
on them. Um, the, it's this idea, because they expect Arbeidsglöl, my pronunciation may not be great, but it's from Arbeider to work and Glöl, the word for happiness, and it literally means happiness at work, a word that ex exists exclusively in uh, Nordic languages, haven't been found any, anywhere else in the world, and Danes are expecting this happiness at work. So if they're not getting it, they do something about it. So there's a lot of stress leave. Um, doctors are very receptive uh, if somebody says they're not they're not feeling great, antidepressants are handed out fairly liberally, uh, in my experience from from my research, and so I think it's just this idea that they are taken care of. Whereas in the UK and the US, there is a culture of soldiering on for fear that admitting any weakness will impact negatively on your career, or there might be a stigma around it. In Denmark, at least, that isn't the case. And in terms of um, sorry, what was the set antidepressants and the cancer rate. Cancer, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll go. I'll go cancer first. Um, the the cancer rate is, from my experience and from my research, Danes are libertarians. They really love to eat ice cream and pork and drink beer and smoke, sometimes all at the same time. And with this freedom within boundaries, they don't see it as the state's role to stop them. So yes, there are high cancer rates. I, I see people just having a hoot all around me, perhaps not looking so good, perhaps not feeling so good, but they know that that safety net is there to catch them as they fall. So there's this sense, well, I pay my taxes. That, that's okay with me. And in terms of Yanti's law, I, everyone know what this means? This is this, um, this it's been, it's sort of slated slightly uh, in recent years, but but basically, I think Norwegian writer was it? No, Danish. Danish. Okay. No, moved to Norway. Moved to Norway. Yeah. <laughs> we share. We share him. Uh, and uh, this fictional uh, list of rules that um, that it's thought that Danes especially live by: uh, you are not to think you're better than anyone else. Um, this really sort of underlining this flat hierarchical structure, and I think this plays into the workplace, where as you say a real fear of conflict and a real collaborative consensus culture. Um, and sometimes, yes, it may limit people. Uh, there is this idea that you don't show off. So a lot of internationals get laughed at for their CVs. My husband, when he moved, his CV was passed around the office and he was laughed at because he was promoting himself, which is what you do on a CV in the UK and in the US. Um, that's not so much the case in Denmark, but actually, they, people are happy at work, they have this Arbeitsglöl, they expect to be happy, they work on it to make sure they're happy, and Denmark is the second most productive country in the EU, so it seems to be working. You know, there is this flat structure, but people seem to be successful. There was a piece on the BBC several years ago, I think in 2012, the first UN study on happiness came out, and Denmark came up on top, no surprise there. And um, I think the BBC reporter did a, a, a wonderful thing, went out to the street, talked to real people, and he talked to one guy, like, what do you think? You know, you are now officially happy, uh, so what do you think that is? And the guy was like, well, I just guess we have really low expectations. <laughs> so is that the key to either personal or national happiness that... Uh, you just make the most of what you have versus setting up impossible targets and then settling for much less. Could be, yes. Um, it could be, I, I, uh, but it could be different. Um, I read in a Danish paper the other week, uh, Politik, and I think it was, uh, about an um, investigation report from uh, something called, which called itself Happy Planet Index. And um, it said that uh, the Danes came on the 32nd place, the Swedes on the 67th place, and uh, can you guess which country took the, the uh, uh, top place? No, not in it. It was Costa Rica. So we should all actually go to Costa Rica if uh, we, we uh, would, would like to emigrate uh, uh, to a really happy country. So. Uh, it all depends on what you mean by happiness, as we started with. I have no idea. I guess we all mean no, different things. Yeah. But it could be uh, happy in Costa Rica, and the expectations uh, on a happy life is maybe different than it is in our part of the world. What does the psychologist say about that? Well, 
in that particular uh, case about the Happy Planet Index, you have a problem because you combine two indexes. So you have ecolo ecological footprints, which is one index, and then you have happiness. And those can't really be combined. So we have to decide how much this one unit of ecology or sustainability, sustainable behavior count compared with one unit of happiness. And there is no way of making that decision, so you have to feel your way. And you can feel your way to make almost any country on the list become either top or bottom, depending on how you weight or how much weight you put on the one unit compared to the other unit. But I think it's a reminder that not only happiness, but also sustainability uh, is important for us. Uh, yeah. We have a question from the audience. And thanks for a great discussion. My name is Paul Mighty Sturenpol. I've lived in Finland, and uh, currently I'm living in Sweden. And my question comes from, I'm wondering what does it take, in, in your opinion, for a country to be considered a Nordic country. Uh, why don't we see a Finnish represent on, on the stage? Uh, can, can Spain sometimes, far in the future, can be considered a Nordic country? What does it make it a, to be a Nordic country? Is it geography, language, happiness? Thanks. Weather. <laughs> well, should I answer that question? What, <clears throat> Well, um, what does it take to be a Nordic country? Well, I, I wrote a book um, about the, the uh, Nordic experience, what we would call it. I would say that it's uh, geopolitics. Um, for Spain, of course, Spain could become Nordic by moving here, but um, I think that the... Um, the fact that these people, these countries are located here, the fact that we have uh, uh, hard and cold and, and strong winters, uh, that we have um, bright summers, and that makes us uh, <coughs> typical Nordic, I would say. Um, there was, we, we had this television series, Brun, in the, the bridge. I don't know if it has been shown in, in Estonia. It probably has. And the, uh, the script writer to that <coughs> TV series, Hans Rosenfeld, he got the question, why is this, um, what is it about Norden, the, the, the Nordic way? And he said, I don't know exactly. Uh, I don't know exactly, but it, it has something to do with the cold winters and, and the, uh, the light summers. It has something to do with that. And uh, that's my answer to you as well. It has something to do with that. And um, uh, for instance, um, there was um, um, Manuel Rojas, who was a Swedish um, politician once now living in Spain, coming as a refugee from, uh, uh, from Chile. Uh, he said once when I asked him what he thought about the, uh, this, um, Nordic psychology, and they said, well, okay, so I understand there is something between your, you people living in, in the Nordic countries, but for a foreigner coming, it's almost impossible really to be like you. We cannot, I can understand it intellectually, but I can mm -hmm. never uh, get one of you. And maybe that's the answer to the question. We're, we're just about... Uh, out of time, but let's uh, go to uh, a very well-qualified authority on this, I suppose. The, we uh, the Swedish ambassador raised his hand on this. I would add something to, to what Bengt, Bengt uh, told. Uh, Norden is, of course, a political construction. And it's a lot about history. And, and being here in, in uh, Estonia, I should say, that uh, Finland was successful. They made very big sacrifices, but they kept their uh, freedom uh, during the Second World War. They had the ability to, to choose to be a Nordic country, and they were welcomed by the others. And that's also the situation today. You have to wish to be a Nordic country, and, and uh, you have to fulfill some criteria that I think have uh, with uh, geography and so on, and you have to be welcomed. That's... Uh, the political construction, it, it's not forever. 
it depends on willing of the people in Norden and in the neighboring of Norden. Thank you. Um, let's do a quick poll as we end this discussion and thank you for gracing this discussion with your presence. How many of you think that Estonia is a Nordic country? Don't laugh. How many of you think we will be a Nordic country even if we're not there now? How many of you think it's a stupid question and we shouldn't even bring it up? <laughs> All right. Well, no, thank <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, dear panelists. Um, if you want to talk to them, I guess uh, you're going to be around, so uh, grab them and uh, give us all your thoughts. So thanks for coming. Thank you.